Good evening. How is everybody this evening? Doing good? All right. My name is Greg Gorga, Executive Director here at the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. I want to welcome you to Origami for an Interdependent World by Robert Salazar. We are in for a treat. Uh, Robert is a wonderful speaker. Um, I want to thank uh, Gene Schuyler, past board president, for being here. One of my favorite people in the world. I want to thank Marie Morris Rowe, our lecture sponsor, for being here. Thank you very much. Yes, let's hear it. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, also thank August Ridge, Giordano's, uh, Martellotta Wines for the, uh, the, the refreshments. Everybody got some wine? Yeah? All right. Good. Um, and of course, TV Santa Barbara is here filming this, so we'll have it on our website in a few weeks. Uh, a couple of things uh, going on at the museum. Uh, uh, you know, every year we bring the tall ship Spirit of Dana Point up from the Ocean Institute. Uh, we finished uh, uh, that program uh, in the middle of October and put... 464th graders aboard the tall ship for the night, living the life of an 1830 sailor. So uh, that was a wonderful experience for those youth, an experience they'll never forget. Uh, on September 20th, we opened the largest exhibit we've ever done here at the Maritime Museum, the history of oil in the Santa Barbara Channel. And then, of course, just a few weeks ago, we opened up Face to Face with the Great Whites, photography by Ralph Clevenger. Did everybody get upstairs to see the, the shark photos? All right, weren't they wonderful? Now do you want to go diving with the sharks? Well, lucky you, the Maritime Museum is sponsoring a trip out to Guadalupe Island where Ralph shot most of those photos in October 2019. So if you're interested in joining us, I'll be aboard. Uh, it is the trip of a lifetime. So uh, you can get f f inches away from the great whites inside a cage so you're safe. All right, um, and then, um, uh, the, the last big event for us this year, the calendar year, uh, was, is, was a, a late edition, so it's not even on our quarterly mailer that hopefully all of you get. But on November 28th, the last Wednesday of the month, uh, any surfers out there? All right, we are doing a special event with Denny Auberg, who wrote Big Wednesday. It's a 40th anniversary celebration of behind the making of the film, Big Wednesday. Uh, Denny and his friends will be uh, playing music for us the first hour, 6.30 to 7.30, and then he'll do a special filling, uh, uh, screening with different clips about the making of the movie, a slideshow uh, from his experience, uh, and then we'll be showing the last 20 minutes of uh, Big Wednesday. So if you're interested in that, the tickets are available on our website. Of course, uh, December 9th is the Parade of Lights. Uh, our ranger, our, our flagship, will be out uh, uh, there in the parade. Uh, it's a wonderful event. So, uh, and this year, um, <clears throat> there's a Santa's Village from 3 to 5 with uh, lots of gifts for the kids. Uh, this year, because we did not have a parade last year, the fireworks are going to be double what it was it is normally. So I uh, hope to see you all down here for the Parade of Lights. Uh, as we get into the holiday season, I hope you'll think about the Maritime Museum. Uh, come shop in our, our museum store or give the gift of membership, a great holiday uh, idea. Uh, you'll also be receiving from us, most of you, uh, our uh, appeal letter asking for your donations. I hope you think kindly of us at this time of the year. Uh, we do depend on those for all the wonderful things we do, these exhibits and these education programs. And of course, I want to thank all of you who are members of the Maritime Museum, members of our Navigator Circle, and those of you who have us in your plan giving and are members of our flagship society. We could not do what we do without you, so thank you. So our speaker tonight, uh, Ralph Salazar, a deployable structures contractor at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, Robert is also an origami artist. He is chief executive and technical officer at Orison, where he develops origami, inflatable, and tensegrity, uh, I practiced that, inspired art and technology towards space exploration and environmental sustainability. Robert has been designing and folding origami for 18 years, and his work ranges in size from a few millimeters to many meters across and can comprise thousands of folds. And hopefully you saw some of his work on display over here. At JBL, Robert designed the origami crease pattern for the Star Shades optical shield and the large origami deployable solar reflectors for the Transformers for Lunar Extreme Environments project. This mission is a NASA innovative advanced concept study 
whose focus is to provide a near continuous supply of power inside the Shackleton Crater for powering a potential lunar base. And in conjunction with his talk tonight, he is also uh, opening a new exhibit with our friends at the Wilding Museum on Saturday out in Solvang. So hopefully you go up there and see his exhibit is up there as well. Please join me in welcoming Robert Salazar. So Nikola Tesla was my inspiration for pursuing the sciences when I was eight. I started folding at the same time. And so uh, this it eventually inspires my ambitions in physics and the rest. So as I go into kind of my story building up to the origami, it's going to make all of my projects make sense. It puts everything in context, I feel. So that's why Nikola Tesla. OK, so I started folding when I was eight. I read a book called Sadako and the Thousand Cranes. And it was the story of Sadako Sasakai, who had survived the nuclear bombing in Hiroshima, but she later got leukemia as a result when she was a child. And she spent the, uh, the remainder of her days in the hospital. And while she was there, she was folding cranes. And we're talking about uh, uh, over 1,000 cranes. And paper was so rare in the post-war period, she was able to do that. And it uh, gave a lot of people hope, especially their classmates. And it started a movement of uh, folding for peace. And the crane is now an international symbol of peace. And after reading the story, it had an impact on me about the tragedies of nuclear war, which, you know, being so young, it's been long lasting. It's been a part of me. And so uh, having access to that story was uh, uh, very appreciative. And uh, as a result of uh, reading that book, I also started folding paper cranes of my own. So it took me about a year before I uh, folded the first thousand, which is really puts it into perspective what she did. I think she folded like uh, 1,600 while she was in the hospital. And uh, so I started folding cranes of my own, and then I was folding from books, and then I started designing my own, and then I uh, get into the rest. Um, so these are the big three influences when I was young. So when I was um, 13, I joined the California Cadet Corps. And it's a military uh, structured organization, a part of schools to uh, build leadership towards academics, and civics, and so forth. And then also, I started um, excavating at the Brea Tar Pits. And so I was working with fossils all the time. And uh, so that's kind of the basis of things. There was a lot of difficult, I had a lot of difficulties in San Bernardino, but I learned that um, uh, where I grew up that uh, it's perspective, it's how you look at things determines how difficult they are. And so that's something that I built on um, later. So um, I went to five high schools uh, for a number of different reasons. And I ended up here in Santa Barbara High School where I graduated. And I, um, I was at a time when um, I was holding a lot of origami. But um, that's right, uh, I had lost a lot of, missed a lot of school during these, um, these years. I said I needed to make up all these classes. And I, at my last semester of high school, I needed to make up, I think, uh, 75 credits, which is, I think it was, what is that? It's like 15 classes. And they said, oh, you got to do you know, the, the super senior. And I was like, oh, I'm not doing the super senior. I don't even have a stable place to live because we lost our house. And uh, so um, I needed to, I decided to go for it. And so I went ahead and I did um, you know, the one through six periods, did the zero period, and I did a full set of classes in adult school, and then I took a class at Santa Barbara City College, and then I took another online high school class. And then I hardly slept at all, and couldn't get all the homework in. I got most of it in, but I, I eventually passed, and uh, I was continuing to volunteer at the La Brea Tar Pits, and I'd take the Greyhound down there and uh, do that sort of thing. And uh, so um, uh, Barbara Chiani found out about it, and she wrote a story, and then that story um, got, uh, the community found out about it, and they really helped me established myself in Santa Barbara. I was able to afford to go to college, et cetera, which it would not have been possible without the help of Santa Barbara. And um, oh, I, I got this award while I was at the Tar Pits during that time. And I also became the most decorated cadet in the California Cadet Corps history of about 100 years. OK. And so during that time, I was just starting to design origami. And so I think I had a real bad bronchitis after spending the night in Hollywood Boulevard. And uh, I want to point out one of them. Where is it? Yeah, there's that wolf. <laughs> OK, so I uh, started designing origami when I was about um, 17. And then um, this is a, I had a realization on February 19th of 2012. And this is going to make all of my projects make sense. So I, uh, this is why I run through it. So what, um, when I was 13, I realized it changed how you look at situations and you feel differently about them. What was difficult before is no longer difficult. And by the time uh, I, was about, sorry, I was about 20, 
I realized that uh, I can change how I feel about anything through a change of perspective. And so then I realized if that's the case, I must be much more than my ambitions and my passions and my interests in physics. These things are not intrinsic to me. These are things I can change with a change of perspective. And I figured if that's the case, and I know that I'm not the only one who can do, you know, apply perspective, anybody can apply perspective, change how they feel about things, and thus we must all be more than our passions and interests. And then I concluded, then if that's the case, how are we different? I realized, well, we're really not so different at all if that's the case. And so then I uh, realized that we're all a single part of a whole, and that the differences between us were so superficial, they were so um, insignificant. And so then I decided to recreate uh, what my interests were. So I decided if I could create any interest, this time with intent, because before I grew up with these passions in physics and the sciences, but I wanted to go out and I wanted to create them from scratch. And uh, the first three things that I knew I needed to do is that the interests that I were going to develop, they must be consistent with each other. Pursuing multiple interests, they start to compete with each other. You pursue one, it undoes the other. And they needed to be synergistic in that by pursuing one, all of the other interests, all the other ambitions, all the other passions benefit. And that they must be in harmony with the physical world, our environment, and with each other's freedom, which was peace. And so I um, concluded that in, if, if I'm going to develop any ambition, any project, anything that I do from here on out, it must be in harmony with the environment and with each other's freedoms. And um, so that was just the, um, the realization that leads to everything else. So here's the projects. Um, let's, let's see, here we go. Okay, so I um, started doing research at UCSB uh, later that year. And I realized, uh, as I was, I was designing these nanostructured thin metal films, and essentially it's a vacuum chamber, and you get the metal and you heat it up a lot, and it evaporates, and then it condenses into a cloud. It's mimicking what happens with cloud formation in the weather, except with metal. And I was creating these various materials, and I realized that the process, I was designing a lot of origami at the time, and I realized that the process of designing these materials and designing the origami was the same, in that I was taking a look at the world, I was creating models of my experiences so that I could recreate things that I saw. And I realized that the difference between art and science, you know, scientific and artistic study was actually the same. And that um, using that knowledge gleaned from that uh, understanding of the world to create things was itself an art form as well as engineering. And I realized the only difference between art and science then was that science requires repeatability and universal um, acceptance as to what the properties are of what you're studying. And then art, you have the freedom where that doesn't uh, necessarily have to constrain what you do. And so then I found uh, the unity between pursuing art and science together. And I, I discovered the photoacoustic effect as a result of uh, that time. Okay. And then I had a further realization about um, the rest of the sciences. I'd been learning in school, there's these different subjects, these different sciences, you know, they got the physics, the chemistry, the biology, the geology, and I was studying all of them at Santa Barbara City College. And uh, I eventually got my associates in um, all the natural sciences that City College offered. And I, at the end of it all, I realized that so much of what was being presented was really redundant. Everything was, um, it was the same ideas occurring over and over again in all of the different sciences. And um, of those, chiefly, were these um, networks. Everything from the, the structures of crystals to the flow of nutrients in ecosystems to the flow of data, the flow of money in an economy, all these things were networks. And if you understood the property of one type of network, you understood the properties of that network in every single context that occurred in nature. And then likewise, uh, for signals that travel between the nodes of a network, or the chaotic behavior that exists in networks when there's feedback loops, when outputs go back into inputs, that go back into outputs, and the effects get amplified or reduced. And then also in the evolution of systems and that they tend to diversify whenever there's selection and uh, reproduction. And then again, with uh, this is a neural network um, view to see in artificial intelligence, this way of solving problems was actually, it was uh, so universal you could apply it to anything. And then the concept of entropy, things becoming order to disorder and how much, how much it relies on the ambiguity of between what is order and disorder. I saw these principles everywhere. And so I knew that if I was going to pursue uh, science, that it didn't make sense to do it in the way that I had been taught, in that um, there are fundamental concepts in science that are universal 
I think that's, uh, so I started to focus on that from here on out. So uh, I never abandoned my um, pursuit of all of science and all of art together. And so this is the reason why. Okay, so um, I uh, started uh, interning at JPL in 2013. And I uh, was designing materials, building on what I had been doing at UCSB. And two years later, I started at JPL on this, what's called the Starshade Project, which is here. And so what this is, it's about the size of a football field. And it's a very large origami deployable sunflower. And what it does is it flies with a space telescope about four Earth diameters away from each other. And uh, it flies in line with a star. And when it does that, it blocks the star's light, but allows the light from the planets around that star to make it to the space telescope. Normally, stars are too bright for that to happen, but this device allows it to be possible. And so it was an idea suggested in 2005 in Colorado, UC Boulder. And they wanted to use origami to solve this problem because they knew that origami can make things very compact and deploy them reliably, but people didn't know how to use origami to solve the problem because origami mathematics is in its infancy, so much so, uh, which is changing progressively, largely due to the work of people like Robert Lang, which you might have heard of, and Eric Germain, and so forth. And so I um, started working on Starshade as an intern, and I uh, solved the, uh, the crease pattern that allows that origami to fold. And so that was my first big engineering project at JPL, and that's led to many others, and so that's why I'm there today. And so I'm a contractor there, and I design deployable structures. And so uh, next was a project called Transformers for Lunar Extreme Environments, which you mentioned earlier, is that this is a Shackleton crater at the south pole of the moon. And at the south pole of the moon, because of where it is on the moon, it, this region is always in shadow for billions of years. And because of its darkness at, and its temperatures, like uh, negative 400 Fahrenheit, whatever volatiles like water ice fall in there, they stay in there forever. And they've been building. There's enough water ice there that if converted to liquid oxygen and hydrogen rocket fuel, you could launch a shuttle-sized craft from the moon every day for 2,000 years. It's, uh, these, this crater rim is uh, as high as Mount Whitney, and the valley floor is wide as uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, but the problem is that it's so cold that robots can't operate, and so you've got to reflect sunlight from the crater rim, of which there's sunlight all year round, and you can do that. But then the reflectors, they need to be about the height of the Statue of Liberty, so not to scale, um, and they need to fit in the rocket. So again, the origami. So JPL has a large demand for these type of structures. There's so much large things you want to build and to put into space, but they've got to fit in the rockets. And so uh, it's a lot of what I do. And this is a, uh, it's a, a habitat a Martian on, on Mars. And it was a competi international architectural competition, so a team and I worked on developing it. And essentially what it does is that it's a geodesic dome. You might have heard of uh, Buckminster Fuller's domes. Uh, this is a, a dome like that, except that all, in addition to just being a dome, it, uh, the whole dome expands three times its diameter, which is why this membrane is all folded up that way. So origami is, you know, great utility in uh, deployable structures. So that's a, a kind of a, an overview of what I do um, at JPL and in space exploration. Now, uh, in addition to the uh, exploring, so the, my big, all my projects are focused, folk centered around um, education, which is tied with peace, and the environment and exploration. And so this one is really. Um, so what it is, it's origami deployable solar concentrator that um, it can desalinate water, it can purify water, it can solar cook, and it's uh, very lightweight and low cost. And uh, with, uh, we won a startup company competition with it at UCSB. And um, I think it would be, and I, I designed it as a, a, uh, something that would be able to assist people who were... Um, uh, affected by climate change, refugee status because of hurricanes, et cetera, something that you can fit very many of these in a small package and deploy them when they were needed. And uh, this is another project. Okay, and now uh, leading up to Origami for an Independent World. So I wanted to use my background and my skills to, um, to be able to make the kind of change that I wanted to make. And so that's really the focus of Origami for an Independent World. And so uh, these are some of the projects that, uh, kind of the kind of projects. 
And uh, okay, so the Channel Islands Marine and Wildlife Institute. The um, so when there's um, marine mammals in Santa Barbara area that are in you know need of help, you might see these pups washed up on the beach. They might be malnutrition. The Marine and Wildlife Institute will come by and they'll take care of them at their place. It's it's Pascalita. And I volunteered there for a day to see how they are in the sea lions. They just have so much fun all day long. And uh, they're getting fed and they get reintroduced into the wild later once they're healthy. And so every year they have a, uh, a fundraising event in October. And so uh, if you, I, always, I donate my origami to them every year. So if you ever like to see them there, they're also there. Um, the Old Pajita Conservancy. So the Old Pajita Conservancy is in Kenya. And the um, northern white rhinos, there's only uh, two left in the world now. And there were three when this project started. And uh, had, the Old Pajita Conservancy is trying to raise funds to be able to develop the technology for in vitro fertilization of these rhinos such that they can you know, be re repopulate. And so uh, they were hosting fundraisers, and I jumped on board. And we went ahead and we tried to raise funds. So anybody who donated a certain amount, you would get one of these rhinos. And so we raised $1,000, a little over, uh, I think, in the month of May of last year. And then since uh, Sudan, uh, the male northern right rhino has since passed away. But um, on the lighter side is that a successful in vitro fertilization did take place at uh, San Diego Safari Park. So there's hope. And they're continuing to raise funds towards those efforts. Um, World Wildlife Fund, I'm um, a wildlife ambassador with them. And uh, so we work on various projects, and we do lobbying in DC, and we talk, we work with other people. And um, so this is a fundraising effort from last year. And we, I, um, anybody who donated, you get an origami, and that was uh, these particular ones. And this was just the one day. So I like to think if you know, I could do more, then it would be more days. Um, all right, uh, f uh, UCSB is fossil free. So the UCs, they, they invest in fossil fuels, and there's a group uh, dedicated to encourage them not to. And so I designed them uh, a little mascot. And so it's uh, everything I fold is a uh, single uncut sheet of paper. And I'm getting to the importance of why that is. So uh, this is yeah, it's the kind of the things they do. And then Danny DeVito, he showed up and talked about fossil fuel divestment because he saw this mascot, so I was quite proud. OK. And now um, the origami. I'm going to talk about um, what origami is and what it isn't, and then how, to, how I go through the process of designing and the works on display. Uh, but first, so I'm going to show you uh, what, how one of these kind of comes to be. OK, so this is a California condor unfolded. So um, you know, a lot of creases. I guess, yeah, I'll talk about um, origami. So origami is always a single uncut sheet. You can never add materials from nowhere. You can never take material away. All these geometric relationships, you can't cut them. You can't do anything to them. And I think it's so much analogous with the relationships we have with our environment. There's just certain physical rules you can't break. And so, um, yeah, it's coming along. And so because it's a finite resource, um, everything that you make with the finite resource needs to be interdependent with everything else. There's no way to create anything without affecting the properties of everything else in the origami. So you can kind of see it taking shape here. So this paper is, uh, it's called unru paper. It's unru foil paper. And unru is a Japanese paper that's uh, handmade from the mulberry tree. So it's a very fine, very thin paper. And then also combine it with the foil. Foil allows it to maintain a very rigid, very static shape that you can mold uh, with a lot of detail. And then I think this one also has a layer of polymer and that allows it to, um, prevents it from tearing under stress. So something is very detailed that uh, tensile strength really helps it out. And there you can see it come together. And so even though all origami are folded from a single uncut sheet of paper, there still remains unlimited possibilities. 
and that because they're all folded from a single uncut sheet of paper, they all have a common ancestry, the uncut sheet. And then from there, they begin to evolve into every possible combination you can imagine. Just like you can imagine uh, the tree of life, we have fundamental ancestry of the original organisms and they begin to diversify. Uh, so too, all the origami you can fit onto a tree and how they're related structurally. How long did it take you to create the original folds? Mm -hmm. So, oh, right. So this video was, uh, is played in reverse of me unfolding it. Otherwise, this would be here for I don't know how many hours. And, uh, or we do a time lapse and it would look like this the whole time. So uh, I like to show it this way. Because where you can see where everything goes and where it came from. There it goes. Yeah, that's a bird. And so uh, I have a much bigger one. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I have a, a much larger one at the a Wadling Museum, which is going to exhibit opens on 3 p.m. on the Saturday. Okay, let me see here. We get into some of the, the genetics. This, this is the equivalent of genetics and biology, where you see you have your animal, and then it has its DNA. This is the DNA of the origami. So these are the, the geometric relationships that make it all possible. So I like to do the birds. I fold so many birds, you can really see the variation with them. OK, I got a point here. Actually, all right, so here we go. Yeah, this up here, that's the wings. There we go, yeah. So you can see that, that little corner back there is here. There's the wing tips. So these are really, these are the feathers. Feathers, wings, okay. And there's the feet. And then that's the beak. So you can imagine this beak coming out of the screen and then everything else draping behind it. And then you can kind of see how it came together. This is structurally very similar to the condor. Actually, there it goes. Okay, so here's four different birds. Actually, let's see it here. Kind of. Okay, so this is the crane, and then this is the brown pelican, which is on exhibit, and then this is the condor, and then this one is an albatross. So you can, uh, you can imagine that the, the wingspan relative to the length of the body is increasing as it comes that way. And you can see how if you want to make the wings longer on an origami, you can't add paper. It needs to come from somewhere else. So you can imagine all this geometry flowing. Um, so in order for this wingspan to grow, the length of the legs starts to shrink. The uh, length of the neck starts to shrink. Let's see. The tail feathers get larger. The number of uh, feathers on the wingtip starts to decrease. And so you can kind of come along and you can see by the time you get to the albatross, the legs are much shorter. The length of the leg is um, that distance. The length of the leg on the crane is that distance. And the length of this one here. So the legs are getting shorter and shorter as they come along. The wings are increasing. And you can see what I'm showing is that um, if you're going to make any change in origami design, everything is affected. And it may not be in predictable ways. So here, some things are shrinking, and all at different rates. Sometimes when you increase the size of something, you decrease it. Something that used to be three toes will turn into four or five or more. So these are called bifurcations. I talked about chaos earlier. This is the chaos in origami. And this is the reason why designing or developing equations that can design crease patterns, analytic equations, is very limited. There, there are equations that exist, but they're very limited in what they can do because they can only, let's say, for example, design birds. And then you'd have something else that can design this specific one. Like Robert Lang has the software that designs origami um, with the limitation that all of the, the uh, what do you call it, the perimeter of the square, all of that perimeter lies on a single axis at the end. And then, other, if, and then also that it's flat foldable and there's various other restrictions. But otherwise, origami, the, you can imagine the vast possibilities of what can be folded. Is, uh, it's too much to handle computationally using traditional analytical, here's the equation type of methods. But there are other ways, of course, because if what we, people can do, machines, you can teach to replicate. So an artificial intelligence could design these. Nobody's written the algorithms yet, but it can absolutely be done. And so there's, oh yeah, so there's the first. So, 
you can see the proportionally the wings get longer compared to the body, the necks are shrinking. Can't see the legs as well, but they also get much shorter. Okay, so now the Oregonian exhibit. So this is uh, the bat ring. So you know, they live here in Santa Barbara. I hear that uh, the wingspans can get as much as my height. And um, yeah, if you're out there in the ocean, if you shuffle your feet, it's said that uh, it'll scare them away. Because they, they do have a stinger in there. It's hidden in there underneath. Um, all right, so about this pattern. So uh, yeah, so here's the little uh, the fins right here. And then here's the tail. And then uh, let's say change proportions. So uh, these kind of finlets, these little wings back here, if those were to increase in size, the tail would shrink. You know, the shape of the wing changes, it would change the shape of the head. Everything is connected. And this was folded from, oh yeah, I guess up there, mulberry paper, very nice paper. Um, yeah, so everything is an original design. Uh, this is the sea urchin. So this one took eight hours to nonstop design and fold. And uh, it, was, um, it took a long time. This is unru paper. So this is that uh, the Japanese paper. It's very thin, very strong, long fibered paper. It reinforced with polymer so it could handle the stresses at the tips. And, uh, and yet to help interpret what all of this means, so all these little points, that's the needles. And then all, wherever you see parallel lines, imagine those parallel lines coming together. So they would, the distance between them shrinks. And then if you imagine that everywhere, you can see that the whole thing is shrinking while the points are coming up. And that's exactly what happens. Yeah, and so these, you know, these guys also live in San... Oh, your question. This is not a square piece of paper. Uh -huh. that, is that a requirement for origami to be square? So in origami, there's... Um, some people have different, um, what is it, um, limitations that they stick to. So some people, they stick to squares. They like squares. Some people do other shapes. Um, some people do rectangles. I can't, so I can't do rectangles. Um, it's just, I feel like, because if you make a rectangle long enough, you can just, you know, trace out anything. Um, I know Robert Lang does rectangles. I know a lot of other people do. Um, I know what's her name? Beth Johnson, she'll do any shape. And uh, I stick to regular polygons. So, I mean, the hexagons have geometries that are just amazing compared to a square. And then I've been using a lot of these pieces that are designed with pentagonal geometry. It's really wild because they don't exactly form grids, which I'll show some of the pentagonal ones too. Um, but yeah, that's my, my stick, yeah, regular polygons. Yeah, there's a sea lion. Okay, here we go, yeah, so there's what are they called, the tail flippers? Yeah, then there's the, the main flippers up here. And then uh, the heads up here. And there are some, in biology, these are called vestigial structures. These are structures that don't serve a purpose in this particular origami. But in the evolutionary history of this pattern, uh, it does. So these in other origami become more prominent and that become the tusks of a walrus. So when I design my origami, I um, I design, usually I design the entire family of that creature so that when I can make just simple modifications to the design and then I can get all of its cousins. And so here's an octopus. And uh, I'm gonna teach this one. So I teach classes at the, at Letter Perfect in Montecito. And so we're, we're gonna do this one next. And uh, yeah, so you imagine again, all these parallel lines coming together. So this is a very simple pattern in that it's just, um, you know, just, okay, so yeah, here's the head. This is actually, this point is inside, is where the brain is really. And then it, unre this point comes and it wraps out, gets wider, comes down into the base. And then the length of this leg is equivalent to this length. And then let's say, for example, I wanted to move this point back, it would have the effect of um, these front legs getting longer, these legs getting longer, that leg getting shorter, this one getting shorter, these two getting much shorter. There's also going to be a uh, gap between these two legs on each side, and um, the head shape's not going to change at all. So that's an example where these modifications, they lead to chaotic effects. 
But uh, yeah, so anything can happen. Okay, this is uh, the kayaker, and this is a fun one. So I don't design these very often, but uh, you can fold origami in such a way that the back of the paper comes up, and so you can get your color change. That's what this is. So one side of the paper is the unru, and the other side is banana. So when you grow bananas, you have the leftover plant, and people make that into paper. And so that's what that is there. And so uh, let's see here. So this is the kayak down here, like this two panels, that's the side of the kayak. And then, uh, let's see what else. Okay, yeah. This is the oar, one oar tip. That's another oar tip, it's the length of the oar. And then this is the hand, right. Wait, yeah, it's this one. This hand, that hand. This is the, which hand is this? That's that hand. And or tip. I actually get myself confused. <laughs> okay, that's one hand. That's the other. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Okay, this is an arm, this is an arm, and this is the hand that looks like it's coming off the arm. That's right. Okay, yeah, so this uh, arm actually ends at the oar, but then it looks like it continues to this hand. That's right. Okay. So you can imagine changing the proportions here, how everything changes. And then here's the great white shark. Um, so yeah, this is a hexagonal one. And then this is the dorsal fin. You have the front. This is the whole front of the head here. And these are the two pectoral fins, these two little small fins back here, and the tail fluke. And then yeah, these subdivisions. So um, I'm showing, I'm pointing out uh, that all these parts, they, they are all very tightly and geometrically related to each other. And by changing any one, you change all of them. And you would think, well, how can you create anything with a finite resource if what you pull on here is pulling on everything else and not in any simple way? But there is a way. There's a way that all of these origami can be designed reliably. And it, it only, the time it takes me to design is equivalent to folding times. I design as I go. And that's true. That can be done with any system that shares that property. So let's talk about networks earlier. So that all of what I'm saying, it doesn't just apply to origami patterns. This is something that's universal to networks. And that whenever you have networks with this tremendous amount of interdependence, and that you change this, it changes that, changes that, there are ways that um, reliably and easily and fluidly you can create things. It's a making the most of what you have kind of idea. And uh, here's California spiny lobster. So these guys are also very important in the ocean. They eat the uh, sea urchins. Uh, so, you know, the otters aren't around, uh, not nearly as many otters around here now. Off coast Santa Barbara, as they used to be, but when they were here, they'd keep the urchin populations down. They would keep them from eating the kelp bases and keep the kelp forest intact. Now, these guys are taking over and doing most of that job. And uh, so, let's see. This is the back fins. And then that tip is that tip. And these are the antennas. You can see all these little tiny, that's the bumps along the antenna. And then what else you got? Okay, so all of these are legs. There's one, two, three, four, five, and then that is the short antennas up here. So that point, that point, that point, that point, short antennas. Yeah, so that's that one. Yeah, that's also the, uh, yeah, the unru, I think. No, it's a banana foil paper, also very thin, strong paper. And then here's the pelican again. So yeah, here's again the feet, the feet, tail feathers, wingtip feathers, there's the back. Is the wingspan. Also, this is a vestigial structure. In some birds, this becomes tail feathers. Some birds, it becomes tail feathers. Sometimes they emerge as different possibilities. Okay, this is the brittle star. So this one actually didn't take as long as the sea urchin. The sea urchin was really something. But this one took, um, I, think it was, I think it was about five hours. Okay, so all these parallel lines shrink in. And all these parallel lines sticking out that way, they don't shrink in. So that's, you know, the legs here. And then these little, let me see if I can do this. That corresponds to one of those bumps. And so that's all those bumps here. And you could add more. So this is one of those very geometric. So if you add more of these bumps, it has the effect that each of those bumps becomes shorter and that uh, the thickness of the leg increases and then the length of the leg decreases. Another interdependent system. 
So imagine, for example, that cuts are allowed. Now, oh, none of this applies. You just go out and you cut it, and then you can cut it however long you want. You can glue on additional pieces of paper. There's no, there's no challenge. But also, this has the consequence that you create waste of paper. There's paper that you've taken off. Or you need to take paper from somewhere else. That's, who knows where that's coming from? Um, and say that you want to take this sheet and you want to fold something else now, but now it has all these cuts. And so now you want to create something new. These cuts, they, you crew them and they build and they destroy anything you might make in the future. But by keeping the paper uncut, it retains its ability to be created into anything. This is analogous to the environment, the relationships we have with each other, that if we protect and maintain these relationships in harmony, they can continue to create anything. They generate no waste. Everything has a purpose, a function. This is just like the concept of entropy. The difference between order and disorder is the same difference between what is useful and what is wasted. And it ultimately comes down to a matter of perspective in that um, if you figure out how to use something, it's no longer waste. And so origami, I feel like, is just the epitome of that practice because you can take something as simple as a sheet of paper, something with almost no complexity by itself, and you can create tremendous complexity. And not only that, you can create chaos. You would think, how can you create chaos with a sheet of paper? Well, it's there. It's everywhere and that uh, you can create this interdependent systems that they mimic so much of our worlds. And so um, origami for me growing up, it taught me almost everything I need to know in a way just because it was so analogous to everything. All of these networks are just like the networks that make up the entire world. And then what you learn about these networks are applicable to all of them. And so that was the, the big thing I've taken from origami over the years. And uh, what I had not expected, it used to take me hours and hours to design anything. It was, uh, sometimes I'd break out the math and I'd solve for equations to come up with just the smallest features like the length of a leg of a spider. But now it's all a very fluid movement and it's because I've realized to tackle these complex interdependent systems, ordinary equations, eh, they, they can't do it. Uh, and it's because of the chaotic element. But you can design them using evolution. And so evolution in nature, it makes mistakes. There are creatures that evolve and then they, you know, they have a mutation and they don't survive. And then there are some mutations, they do survive. Origami is in the exact same way. So because you cannot predict all the possible bifurcations and how things are going to change with these subtle adjustments, you go ahead and you try it and then you're like, this doesn't work. And you come back and then you go forward. And you're always shifting um, regions of the paper. So there's never any waste throughout the entire process. You're allocating resource here, and you're sending it back if it didn't work. You're widening things here. Things are shifting over here. It's all about shifting. I imagine there's games that are like that. And uh, yeah, I think origami is a good way to show that. And then here's the blue whale. And there's the little tail flu. You can see this is structurally very similar to the sea lion. And also, it's, I would consider it in the same family as the, the bat ray. And then. Um, yeah, the others, not so much. All the birds are in the same family. They're all on, I have a tree. I, I'm going to draw this tree someday, but I have a tree in my head of how all of them are related. And you can take the origami of any designer, ever, all of the origami ever, and you can put them onto a tree and see how they're all related. See, there's a little tail fluke up there, and there's the fins. Yeah, I think that's the last origami I have up there. Yeah. Okay. So, um... Yeah, the, uh, the takeaway that I wanted to give here is that, um, yeah, even with something that's as simple as a sheet of paper, you can create that remarkable complexity. Even with, you know, the resources that we have now, you can create incredible complexity. There's no limitation there with finite resources. You might think that, you know, because there's only so much, you can only do so much. But origami, I think, is proof that you can do, you can create anything. There's really no limitations on the diversity of structures that you can make. And that uh, evolution is key to being able to do these things is uh, going ahead and trying things. Not just trying things randomly, like random creases across, but there's intent. There's uh, fundamental structures. Because once you build up the tree, you're like, okay, well, I'm going to make something new. It's already similar to something else. So it only needs subtle modifications, subtle design. But uh, building that tree in the first place is important. And I think it's applicable to everything. That's uh, what, uh, ultimately what I wanted to share. And so... Uh, Yes, that, that's, that's, that's the end. That's what I have. You have to be a genius to do this. Oh, that's the other part. So I think that I don't believe in, I don't believe in geniuses at all. I, don't, I think that um, it's so hard to be creative in today's schools. It's so hard because we have standards. Uh, you know, I think a fundamental part of education is inheriting ideas and passing them on. 
But as you do that, it becomes hard to foster new ideas. And so, just like in evolution, uh, something that's new may not be competitive in the beginning. It needs time to grow and develop. An idea needs time to grow independently before it can become very competitive. Uh, that's what, where a revolution would have, an understanding of something. And um, so I, oh, schools, I just, I do not see that. So me and schools have had trouble my entire life uh, for that reason. And, uh, but it's something that all of us do when we're, when we're young. You know, we're, we're playing, we're coming up with all kinds of things. And if it doesn't fit the standard in school, then you know, it uh, may not be so great. Even if it doesn't initially, given time, I think so many of these ideas that they're allowed to grow and phosphor, just like in evolution, they can grow and evolve into new things. So like I pointed out, these structures, yeah, you know, a while back, of things like, here's a good one. Like this structure, you think, oh, that's not useful. It doesn't do anything. But I keep it there because in this bird's family, it is very useful. So if I, uh, let's say, what if I want to do, yeah, if I want to make this wingspan shorter, like in the crane, and I make this neck longer, this is going to become too small for tail feathers. This is where the tail feathers are going to have to come from. And so it's an example of one of those things. Um, so we all have crazy ideas. And I feel like these ideas may not be so crazy if you give them a chance after a while. So uh, I think uh, being a uh, genius is nothing more than thinking differently. Sometimes the way you think is very applicable to certain problems and not so applicable to other problems. I'll tell you, there's things that I cannot do, uh, like writing. Writing, I've had trouble with writing my whole life. But I can talk, I can talk about stories all day long. And um, it's just because of how I look at things. Thinking of things in networks, networks do not go into lines in a sequence on a page. So that's been nothing but trouble. But other ways of thinking, it's very easy. So uh, in short, yeah, I, yeah, genius, I don't believe, because it's just the, there is only the diversity of thought. And this thought is either very applicable to some problems or not. And maybe those problems will emerge someday, or maybe they won't. But uh, I think promoting uh, intellectual diversity, diversity of different ideas is very important because of that. We're all geniuses. It's just uh, we need to find the right problems we're geniuses of. Oh, so um, I design all of my origami, with very few exceptions, all freestyle. So I grab the sheet, see it in time, and then I dive into it. When I was younger, I couldn't do that because I didn't have that tree of life I had talked about. But now, I think, okay, the sea urchin is very similar to other things. So the sea urchin is very geometric. So really, it's just, in my mind, in the beginning, it was just four points. Was it four points? Yeah, four points. Shaped, I can't even do those fingers, but shaped like this. Two equilateral triangles stacked on each other. All right, there's my four points. They all have the same length. Repeat the pattern everywhere. And then I can repeat that. I can make as many spines as I want. Fortunately, I stopped at 49. And uh, I've done 64. Um, but anyway, um, it's, uh, it's all freestyle because every new origami is already somewhere related on this tree. So it's just like with uh, you know, knowledge of new ideas, you can build on things that have been done before with subtle modifications. Sometimes something is so different, though, like the, what was really different in this one? Oh, the kayaker. There's nothing like the kayaker in all of these. It's really um, structurally different. There's none of the origami in my tree is like this, so I really needed to think about this from scratch. But now that I have it, I can now do all the modifications of that one. So uh, that was an answer to a question. Okay. I think. That's a good question. Can you repeat the question, Rob? Yes. So how, this is how I decide the uh, shape of the paper that I choose. So it really it comes down to this. It's really just kind of a small detail in the design, is that this point, the, num the amount, in math you'd call this the number of degrees between in this angle, uh, determines how thick this point is going to be when it's made into like a long, like a point, like uh, of the sea urchin. So if this is an equilateral triangle, you can make them very long and very thin, and but you only get three. Move to the pentagon, they're still pretty sharp. They're not as sharp as the, or as long as the square you could make, but they're better than the hexagon. And that's, that's really what it comes down to. So you think about, okay, I get five really long, thin points right off the bat, and I can use those, and so here I use them. There's one point, there's one, there's two, and then one kayak is point is actually really thin, and the other one's really thick if you look at it. That's the thin one, that's the thick one. The hand is very thin. It's 
kind of a, not the best use of that corner, maybe. And then the other head is thick, and then the other hand is thin. So that's why, that's how I, I come up with that one. Mm -hmm. Is origami, the way you do it, closer to in vitro fertilization for genetic counseling? <laughs> <laughs> when you're talking about creating things, mm -hmm. which model do you think are more similar? Yeah, I would say so. Um, Yes. Um, the question is, uh, what is origami more analogous to? In vitro uh, changing, in vitro modifications of DNA, or um, what is genetic counseling? Yes, I'm not familiar with genetic counseling exactly. But I can relate origami design to the genome, uh, and modifying the genome. So it's the natural way. It's just like evolution. So you have this big old string of folds, and you have a large set to choose from, and there are subtle modifications along the way. They're just coming along. Rarely do you have to do a fundamental, you know, overhaul. So um, this is not building DNA from scratch. It's not analogous to that. You can imagine how difficult that would be. Uh, and it's the same in origami, that um, it's not being designed from scratch with an equation where you're thinking, all right, I need this length, this length, this length, and that length. What is the origami pattern that gives me those things? Tremendously hard problem, even for a machine. You could develop an artificially intelligent algorithm to solve that problem, but even that algorithm would have to be trained. So, uh, which, by the way, the artificial intelligence, it uses evolution in order to design. So I use these algorithms at work myself, and what they do is they, um, they keep trying things in the algorithm. They say, oh, did this, they have, literally have a score of how close they got to the solution. And they say, all right, how close was I? Got really close, give a lot of weight to that solution. We might, that way of thinking, we might use that again. And if the way of thinking, they try it and it doesn't work, they're like, all right, we're gonna give this lower weight. And they keep trying all these solutions. They keep trying different solutions. And eventually, like, all right, this comes, brings us really close. You can let the algorithm run for as long as you want. It gets us really close then that's going to be the one that we're going to use. It has like 95% accuracy. You have an equation that is an approximation of the solution and was found through evolution. So evolution, again, coming up in artificial intelligence. That's, yeah, that's what makes them possible and that's why they need to be trained. Um, any question? Hmm. Yep. What are your parents do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my mother is a, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. She's a uh, assistant, but also a psychic medium. She makes jackets. She makes jackets. Yeah. She, but she's only been doing that. She, she's had about 30 job occupations during my life. Yeah. And she's lived in about 30 different places. And um, she had me when she was 18. So we grew up figuring out the world together. And um, back in San Bernardino, you know, of all places. And um, yeah, she does all different kinds of things. But currently, yeah, it's like psychic stuff. Life coaching. Life coaching, psychic stuff. Okay. And then uh, my dad is an electrician, so he's the one who introduced me to Nikola Tesla. He said, don't worry, don't you worry about the Thomas Edison. Nikola Tesla was the true inventor, and he really was. He's the one, he's the reason why <laughs> um, every electronic device in the room is possible to be having it here because of uh, alternating current. He's the one who popularized the idea and showed that you can take uh, voltages and you can increase their voltage, you can decrease their voltage very easily, whereas uh, Tom Edison's DC this was very hard to do and then required batteries and all sorts of things. Yeah. So. Yep. How do you choose uh, the paper, like the like paper type? So this is how I choose my paper. And it's taken years to get to the point where my answer is consistent. And so if I'm doing a lot of detail, I go for a thin paper. And if I'm doing a lot of detail, there's going to be a lot of stresses. Not necessarily in the final model, but during the folding process. Because a lot of times, structures, they compete. They're very strained during transition sometimes, before they go to stable states. And it's like living things in evolution. You make one change, the organism might die. You make two changes of the right type, it can survive. And so origami is a lot like that also. And so, um, yeah, the, lo the long fibered papers handle the stress very well. So that's an unruh. That's the banana plant. 
That's Lakta. Lakta paper is a wonderful paper. It's made in, handmade in Nepal, and it comes from the Daphne bush. You just harvest the bark, the bark grows back, it's sustainable, and uh, it's a thicker paper. The most ancient um, Tibetan Buddhist texts are made from that paper, still around, of course, and um, that, it's thicker. So that's the bears, the mammals. Birds, detail, that's unru, that's banana, and there's also other. So there's gampi, which is a kind of paper that comes from the mulberry tree. There's a lot of paper that comes from the mulberry tree. The paper I listed earlier is just mulberry. That's how it was marketed. It looks to be like a shorter fiber paper. It's very smooth. So um, yeah, so a thicker paper gives you, it gets rid of wrinkling. Thinner paper gives you wrinkles. Thinner paper gives you more detail. Thicker paper, you get less detail, but you can get some very well-rounded forms. It's like the sea lion is folded from the, the lakta. As I think it might be the only one, actually. The most of them are folded from unru. And then uh, also scale is very important because you can make the same origami small, too thick. You can't, can't actually fold it, make it larger, and now it's thin enough. But there's also a fundamental limit that I'm trying to battle with with making very large origami in that if you um, make them very large, they need to be stiffer so they're not so floppy. But if you make it stiffer, it needs, the paper needs to be thicker. And if the paper's thicker, it means if you're going to make a crease, it's going to cause permanent damage. It's going to literally uh, tear. So it's kind of a problem I'm working on. Yes? What are the materials in NASA that are supposed to go into space? Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, that's one of the favorite things I do at uh, JPL is uh, working with the materials, fantastic materials. So ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. So shopping bags made of polyethylene, they kind of tear apart slowly. That's because the molecules are very short. The molecules are very long, like in the papers, very strong. The only things that are stronger, actually it's, it's one of the strongest materials for its weight that we know of. Um, that's a flex, that's tensile strength. And uh, so I, I use that for a lot of things. There's a material and it's radiation resistance, which is amazing. And then there's Kapton. Kapton, usually you see it silvered. Its natural color is orange. You see that in spacecraft all the time. Starshade, probably going to be made from Kapton. And that one uh, can handle tremendous amounts of radiation. Temperature changes to 400 degrees Fahrenheit down to very small cryogenic temperatures. And um, then there's Mylar. Mylar tries to be Kapton, but it's, it looks a lot like it, but it's not going to survive radiation in space. And if you do put it in space, you put it in the layers of insulation. So it, usually spacecraft have jackets so they don't freeze. You got layers of mylar, and then you have the capton layer, and that protects it from the sun. And then what else you got? And then a lot of the other materials that I use aren't folding, they're more like tensile stuff. Oh, oh, Teflon, Teflon. Teflon has amazing chemical resistance. It's very soft. It's uh, very foldable. And then it has a cousin called FEP, which is a fluoro ethyl FEP film. FEP film is amazing chemical resistance, but also you can thermally weld it to itself so you can make inflatable things with it. And um, well, it's really the big ones, my favorite ones. And then, you know, there's a low density polyethylene, so there's others. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so um, you can, once you design, and actually you don't even need to design that much. If you um, fold a lot, you can interpret crease patterns. So you can look at them and you know, okay, I know what the structure looks like. Now, I should also mention that this is not nearly all the creases that make this up, but these are the fundamental creases. This shows the fundamental structure. All of the creases you saw in the condor, you have all of the feathering that happens in the wings and so on, and then all the detail that makes it up. But um, you can read them. Yeah, so, well, I showed you the one way is that all these parallel lines, they come together. They kind of squeeze. Yeah, they squeeze together. This is a very easy one to read, just like instantly. And then this one's a little bit trickier because you have to think about exactly what stuff like this is. And you're like, oh, OK. Because when you put all these large long folds together, all of these guys all line up into two lines. Actually, it's one line. And that one, all this means is that, all right, you folded this whole large structure, and then you folded one corner down. And that one fold created all these little tiny folds. So you have to be able to see the, the larger structure come together and see, OK, there's that fold. Yeah. yeah, so you can read them. 
you can read crease patterns like you read books, but it doesn't give you the whole thing. It gives you just the structure. Yeah, that's a good question. So where do you start? So I also should mention before I started designing origami frequently, I used to look at these patterns because artists will sometimes make them available so you can fold them yourself. And um, where do you begin? A very, there's no single answer, but there are definitely some general trends. The longer the crease, the more likely it's an initial crease. Um, and then, uh, what else? That's actually, that's a good rule. And then there's also some shapes that come up a lot. So like, uh, so I'll, do, I'll explain this one. So this is what I would do. You got this really long isosceles triangle coming up here. And then you have this triangle on the side, triangle on the side, little guy at the bottom. And then you have this trapezoid and a triangle. Fold those first. And then bisect those angles, because those are angle bisectors. That's at the altitude of the triangle, altitude of the triangle. I never had to learn geometry, because this was geometry. Because you, you learn, if you, I feel like you could just teach kids origami. Geometry is unnecessary. You never need to take the class entirely. OK, so here, um, actually, there's, I know there's someone in Israel who does that and is very successful. So there's teachers out there. OK, so angle bisectors, they come along. You do those. And then you're like, OK, well, I have this concentric triangle inside of this larger triangle. You know what that means? It means that you fold those edges together, and then you sink it down. And that's what that is. And now that you have that sink down, you have this corner that's sticking up. And then you fold that down, because that's what that means. And then this is very easy again. So you just fold along the bisectors of that angle. Bisector means it's the line in between the two lines. It's equal angle on each side. And then you have all these concentric trapezoids, which means fold it down, in, up, down, 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 until it becomes very thin. So you see this kind of stuff? It means you're, oops, it means you're th thinning things. Actually, yeah, so show it here. So this is, you're showing thinning. So you're making this big triangle thinner, thinner, thinner. So that's an easy one to interpret. That's very easy to interpret because it's just these parallel lines. This is a tricky one to, if I saw this, I'd have to think what's going on. Like, what is that? And what that is, if you were to line up all these really long folds together, all of these would make a very simple triangle. So it's just a triangle that's been smeared out. You can kind of think of it that way. Yeah, that's very easy. This one has a lot of that. So those corners that just get folded down, that's all that is. These are squash folds, I think some people call them. Yeah, so that's, that's generally what you would look for. You see patterns. And if you want to learn how to begin to develop the vision, fold a lot of origami and unfold them and look at the structures, and then you will find a way. And if you, at the point when an artificial intelligent algorithm for designing origami comes along, it's exactly what will happen. Is that till you'll tell it, this is the structure that resulted from that pattern. Remember that, okay. And then they go along and they'll, that's how you'll train them. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Oh, what good question. Or, and what is the smallest? Mm -hmm. So the largest origami I folded is um, I did at Santa Barbara City College. They had just poured cement in a new room, and I knew that room had to be mine. And I bought a 18-foot uh, sheet of paper on a roll. And I uh, walked all the way down to City College with it, laid it out, and then I folded a brachiosaurus. And it stood about nine feet tall. And I have uh, all this stuff on my website. Um, the video of me going in and folding and that kind of thing. And it was one of the first origami to actually get inside of and do the folding I had to. And I also realized that you have to approach the sequence of folding in an entirely different way because what's as easy as turn the paper over is now a very large maneuver, a very delicate procedure. But uh, in origami, I have mentioned before that um, going from blank sheet to final product, there's many different pathways of getting to the same point, usually. Many different ways you can get there. So uh, even when you're folding origami very small, it's a totally different skill set, totally different way of making the folds. Even very, like I had mentioned, I had made some origami that are like millimeters. And it's um, these fingers, no tools, and you, there's ways you can get, you know, sub-millimeter folds very easily. You just, I could, I could show you sometime after. You just get the edges, you push them together slightly, and you swipe the bump down, and when you do that, you get sub-millimeter folds. So um, there's just different techniques. And then let's see, star shade. Some of the star shade models were two meters, so a little taller than I am. A lot of them were. Some of them were about that big. 
Um, California condor is working on for the Wildling Museum. That one had a eight foot wingspan. That one's not on display. It's still at home. Yeah, that's the largest one. Mm -hmm. So should children start with the instructions like you find them on calendars, origami mm -hmm. calendars and things, or do they use their own imagination with a blank sheet of paper? Yeah, so uh, kids starting origami. Um, I started designing way late, and I was fooling from instructions. And I'll tell you, it was uh, in, it was an engineering practice. It was not an art form at that time, really. It was um, uh, was very uh, it was frustrating because <laughs> you get stuck following the diagrams all the time. Now we have the internet and YouTube; it's much easier, I think. But at the same time, it's easy to get stuck. Absolutely, I recommend for kids starting origami start designing right away because there's no reason why you can't start designing right away. You can design simple things. You learn more complex techniques as you go along, paper choices and that kind of things. And the paper that you fold with largely influences what you'll design too. And so, yeah, kids starting origami should start designing right away. I mean, I started, I remember my, my first, first designs or modifications of the crane. I think of which ones those were. Yeah, the hummingbirds, modification of the crane. Did you have a question? Oh, yeah. I'm very fortunate that um, at J. Well, so this is how I spend my time working on projects. I'm very fortunate that at JPL they give me the freedom to um, work on very early stage stuff, what they call TRL one to three, technological readiness level. This is when you go from back of the napkin calculations to prototype that works. That's what I focus on. Um, like my friend Chris, who was in that picture of me as a cadet, we work together still, of course. And uh, so he does more like the later stage stuff. But uh, so I focus on early things. So I spend a lot of my time inventing, thinking up ways to solve problems. Um, for example, there's a, what's called a NIAC. Transformers was one of them, but this is another one I'm working on right now. And I found a way of, um, the people have found ways of getting through the ice on this icy moon called Europa that's around Jupiter. An ocean, there's an ocean there on Europa that's chemically so similar to ours. And uh, it would be amazing to explore that ocean to see what's down there. But 30 miles of ice, people have found a way to get through it. But how do you get down into the ocean and explore when your whole 30 miles, not 30 miles, 30 kilometers of ice is only so big and so deployable? And so I, I spent time thinking of a solution where you can actually get things down into the ocean to explore. Um, there's another one, my, uh, my group supervisor, who came up with the Transformers project. He said, all right, we need something that's going to be able to get up to the crater rim, because they're not going to land anything up there. It's too precarious. And well, rovers, not so great going up steep slopes with a lot of rocks. And so I said, find a way. And so I thought up a multi-legged creature. So it's a uh, tensegrity robot, many it's six legs. You can have any number of legs, but six legs. And then it uh, pulls tendons, and then it, it uh, walks. Very lightweight. It starts out, a pro uh, starts out about this. Yeah, about this size, and then it opens up its legs and stands about four feet tall. Then each of those segments of its legs extends three times, bringing it to a total of 12 feet high. And now it can walk around and carry things, because the moon is so little gravity, it's not too hard. So, yeah, a lot of time just walking. So at JPL, I'm very rarely in the lab unless I'm building things. I'm always walking around JPL, because it's so nice, you know, Pasadena is nice. And there's a lot of deer also in Pasadena. Thank you.